for me, and especially into this wonderful room, uh, the Foundation Organization of Medicine in London, and these uh, medical worthies looking down from the walls. So I will keep returning to a rather medical theme. Two books by Robert Desnos, and this one is like a brick. I don't know how I managed it. My other Desnos book is this one. Uh, it's my only children's book. It's called Story Songs, or if you turn it over, Chant of Fable. It has beautiful illustrations in it. It has 30 little animal poems. Uh, each one appears in both languages where you'll see them together. Uh, I, the poem that I'd like to start off with is not in is Desnos, but it's not in either of these two books. This is a medical one. It's called The Cat That Looks Like Nothing At All. And it starts off, Le chat qui ne ressemble à rien, aujourd'hui ne va pas très bien. The cat that looks like nothing at all is feeling lackadaisical. <laughs> he goes to visit the doctor bloke who pokes his chest with a stethoscope. Your heart is lackadaisical. It also looks like nothing at all. There's nothing to match it from London to Dutch it. From here to Crete, it's non pare. He goes to visit his Mary Jane, who gives him a brain scan on his brain. Your brain is lackadaisical. It also looks like nothing at all. On the surface of the earthly ball, there's nothing to counter this at all. That's why the cat that looks like nothing at all is feeling flat and lackadaisical. <laughs> the zebra. That terrible horse, the zebra, shakes a hoof as he takes it away. He makes every zebra vertebra reverberate with his brain. From his stable by sable Zambezi, he flips when the flitting is easy, and samples on sunny savanna, black heart grass a la Fata Morgana. The prison has printed on his hide shades of the view he saw inside. You can't quite see the very beautiful blue bird perched on the rump of the zebra. Uh, Desnos, as a young man, uh, 1922, 24 or so, found his way to the surrealist group uh, <coughs> around André Breton, and he quickly became the star. They were trying to reach the subconscious by means of sleep and hypnotism, and in that apparent condition, Desnos produced an, a lot of extraordinary super spoonerisms for a character called Eros c'est la vie, which might mean Eros is life, or it might mean drink a toast to life. She was a, a woman uh, invented by Duchamp. Uh, it was her, his alter ego, as the Queen's Latin Society would insist on saying. And um, he, he, there are pictures of him wearing a huge floppy velvet hat. Anyway, he wrote, Duchamp wrote six uh, rather rude spoonerisms for this character. Desnos picked up the ball and ran with it and wrote 199 of them, all of which are in my book. And here are some. Eros c'est la vie propose que la pourriture des passions devienne la nourriture des nations. Eros c'est la vie proposes that the perishing compost of passions becomes the nourishing repast of nations. De cirrhose du froid meurt la foi du désir de Eros. Eros's desire of love forever dies of cirrhosis of the liver. <laughs> he fell out, as they all did in the end with Breton, who, who, who kept trying to tell them what to do. He does not say surrealism has to go out into the world. It can't just be a little club. I'd like to read you uh, from a poem, a long poem of his from his middle period, called Flint and Fire, a passage about Baron. Baron passed the Pyrenees, reached Toledo, tarried there, dreamed amid the olive trees of the fair and not so fair. He was loved by one insane lady with no brain in Spain. Lady with no brain in Spain, quite the fairest in the place. Near me Lord, the lass insane, felt her heart in turmoil race. Then the beauty died of love like a citadel sealed off. 
Like a citadel sealed off, she was carried in her shroud. There alone, but dreaming of other beauties, walked me lord. All the crowds along the way watched the last remains go by. Watch the last remains go by. Men were hurling imprecations. Rusty souls spat bigotry. Some were traitors to their passions. Through the jeers without a word, through the insults came my lord. Through the insults came my lord. Eyes of heavy ocean swell. Constables and matadors, country bumpkins, back they fell till he reached the senoritas, massively endowed pepitas. Massively endowed pepitas, duchesses and ditty tweeters, raven-headed Romany, lasses all with modest eye. When he reached them up ahead, Bravo Toro, the fairest said. Bravo Toro, the fairest said. Here's my body and my soul, here's my love unlimited, hugs and kisses, twists of gold. He was loved by two insane ladies with no brain in Spain. <laughs> I have three charming ladies to help us through the evening and I'd like to call first on my very good friend Cornelia Osborne to come up and, and to be here please and uh, read in German for us. Cornelia is a, a professor emerita at Roehampton and uh, she it was who helped me uh, translate German uh, the first translations I did in modern times uh, were with her. Uh, she also gave me a book uh, of the poems of Ricarda Huch. This is a very distinguished uh, German writer who, who had a very long life. She was mainly novelist, essayist, uh, a historian, but also a poet, but a very traditional poet. Uh, and so I'm coming back uh, more or less to the medical theme with her poem which begins, Nicht alle Schmerzen. Um, okay, Ricarda Huch. Um, nicht alle Schmerzen sind heilbar, denn manche schleichen sich tiefer und tiefer ins Herz hinein. Und während Tage und Jahre verstreichen, werden sie Stein. Du sprichst und lachst, wie wenn nichts wäre. Sie scheinen zerronnen wie Schaum. Doch du spürst ihre lastende Schwere bis in den Traum. Der Frühling kommt wieder mit Wärme und Helle, die Welt wird ein Blütenmeer. Aber in meinem Herzen ist eine Stelle, da blüht nichts mehr. Thank you. Not every hurt can be healed, for many seek to the heart's most secret throne. As the days and years wear on, they settle deep, turn hard as stone. You talk and laugh as if it were not so. They seem like a froth dispersed, and yet your dreams are burdened down and show that trace accursed. Spring comes, spring comes, warm breeze and smiling face. The world is a flowery sea, but ever in my heart there is a place no bloom can be. So extremely traditional. She's probably writing that in the 1940s. She's lived through the two dreadful wars and um, she's resisted, stood up to the Nazis, emerged with honor, and, uh, but she continued to write poetry the same as she had done in 1895. Uh, so now I mentioned Hans Arp. Uh, this, so although it's much earlier, it's the mid twenties. So, uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Cornelia to read a very short passage which begins Die Drittrigen Leiber. Okay, this is a Zungenbrecher, a real tongue twister, so I hope I'm not coming a cropper here. Die Drittrigen Leiber sind oben groß und rissig wie ein Erdteil, unten klein und fleischig wie ein Überzwerg. Sie tragen rauchende Zwielenhände. Sie blasen auf ihrer Eselsbesaune wie Waldhanswurst-Kadetten. Ja, ja, ja. Sie blasen wie ein vokativ geblankhörster Gondelmehlsack. Nach den Spielregeln geregelt, für alle Fälle einmal, für Todesfälle zweimal. 
from Wodenrot bis zum Abendrot. And of course, a lot of these words don't exist at all. They're entirely invented for yes. their sound quality. <coughs> Even by German standards, where a lot of words appear made up from our point of view. But, uh, <laughs> these ones really are. The trisexual bodies are big on top and fissured like a continent, small lower down and fleshy like a super dwarf. They wear smoking shirts of calluses. They blow their jackass trumpet like goofy cadets in the wood. Hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw. They blow like a vocatively blank-versed gondola fatty puff, ruled by the rules of the game, once in all cases, twice in cases of casualty, from chic red sky to shepherd's pie. I translated the poem and it was published and uh, a young man wrote to me from Montreal. He was in an extreme minority situation because he was a French speaker teaching in an English college in Montreal. And this was a much loved poem by Aragon as I realized perhaps a bit too late that I'd taken what he considered liberties. And he said, look, you haven't, why do you call this a translation? It's nothing of the kind, you just invented a poem. And I, I answered him back. I said, I don't do what the dictionary does. When, when I write a poem, you get a poem. Well, that's uh, when I write, a, when I translate a poem, you get a poem. That's what I'm aiming to do. Uh, leave behind war-torn Europe and its uh, complications and head for Latin America. And I'm delighted to call uh, Isabel Bermudez to come and help us. Thank you. Isabel was born in Colombia and she is a poet whose work, which is written mostly in English, is often being shortlisted or commended. And she's a language tutor in French, Spanish and English. And I'd also like to introduce to you the great Mexican writer Alfonso Reyes. I will eventually have a book of his, but I, I'm not finished with him yet. Uh, Reyes uh, was, uh, his dates are 1889 to 1959. He's extraordinarily prolific and versatile. His uh, prose volumes take up that much, uh, and he's done uh, two volumes, I think, of verse, one of which is uh, translating much of the Iliad into rhyme, rhyming couplets, and the other is an incredible variety of poets, uh, poems in all kinds of meters or none. But he is, above all, an extremely skillful and brilliant versifier. Uh, it is a challenge which I like to think I can rise to. Now this poem, which again is a medical theme, it's written to his friend Enrique González Martínez, doctor, poet, surgeon, and diplomat, as Reyes himself was, and as Octavio Paz was. Paz, who you will have heard of, uh, said, the love of Reyes for language, for its problems and mysteries, is something more than an example. It is a miracle. A E G M, en sus 50 años de médico. Poeta médico y poco de lo que habla la opinión, pues Demócrito y Platón sienten que el poeta es loco. El poeta está en el foco, en la penumbra, en galeno. Muy bueno, dos veces bueno si la traja por igual del cuerpo remedia el mal y del, y, del ánimo el, y del ánimo el veneno. Again, it's a bit of a tongue twister. Uh, to EGM, 50 years a doctor, poet, mm -hmm. doctor, and no way that which people think and say, Democritus and Plato said every poet's off his head. Here's the poet on parade, Doctor shyly in the shade. All is well, and doubly well, if his remedies control, heal the body's hurt, and heal, to the poison of the soul. Which I hope poetry does. And now we come on to an, uh, an incredibly ingenious poem of his, which is an acrostic, so you're reading down the initial letter of each line which reads uh, to Margarita Ulloa Elias, who is a young girl in Peru, uh, quite a long way away. So in the Spanish it's a Margarita Ulloa Elias, and in the English it's to Margarita El Ulloa Elias. And we're dealing with very short lines and a lot of rhymes. Decimas en acróstico. 
para una niña peruana. Aunque muy de tierras lejas, Margarita, quiero aquí aconsejarle de ti, revelándote mis quejas. Ganarás, si así me dejas, aprovechar la distancia, rimas que en su consonancia imiten mi voluntad, terca en la dificultad, atrevida en la constancia. Una niña del Perú locos afanes traía, lo que la niña podía, ojalá lo entiendas tú. Acabar un verso en un, en el dar será lo enojo, los pies de un poeta cojo, imponerle en fin con tretas, acrósticas por muletas. ¿Sabes si logró su antojo? Acrostic for a Peruvian child to Margarita Ulloa Elías. Though I'm absolutely an out of your area man, Margarita, I pursue a conference with you, revealing my hesitancies, giving, if I apply, absence profitably, rhymes whose assonances imitate my aspiring, tough, tricky and tiring, audaciously loyal to you. Unusual wishes of this last far away in Peru, look at her caprices, Odd and well known to you, a line that ends in you, emending with one eye shut, she's lightened a poet's flat feet, imposing on him, how neat, acrostics as his crutches. So I wonder, will this do? Thank you very much, Isabel, for now. I'd like to move on to my Shakespeare book and ask uh, Janice Wendell to come up, please, to read. And Janice is the publisher of my Shakespeare book, uh, which I can't reach. There's one there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is my Shakespeare book. Now, it's called Loving by Will. And Janice is, is not only the excellent publisher, but she's also the excellent watercolorist who has done this magnificent portrait of our national bard. The thing about this book, you may see a sign here, a no entry sign for the letter E. Uh, that's because I've rewritten all his 154 sonnets without using the letter E. And they've come out a lot easier to understand and my view is that most of us only know about five or six of the sonnets and they don't get to find the extraordinary story of Shakespeare's love life. The, absolutely tumultuous ups and downs and uh, deceits, denials, betrayals, all the rest of it. Uh, so Janice will read uh, Shakespeare's own words and I will read my words. Sonnet 118. Like us to make our appetites more keen, with eager compounds we are palate urge, as to present, prevent our maladies unseen, we sicken to shun sickness when we purge. Even so, being full of your ne'er cloying sweetness, to bitter sources did I frame my feeding, and, sick of welfare, found a kind of meatness to be diseased ere that there was true needing. Thus, policy in love to anticipate the ills that were not grew to faults assured, and brought to medicine a healthful state, which, rank of goodness, would by ill be cured. But thence I learned, find yet the lesson true, drugs poison him that fell so sick of you. So my title, I put titles on all these, again not using the letter in, uh, what is this about not using the E? Well, it's a habit I picked up from a French group called ULIPO, which stands for Ouvroir de Littérature Potentielle, and uh, it's one of their favourite of their very numerous tricks. There's an entire book, a novel without the letter E by Perret, called La Disparition, which is translated into English as a void, again without the letter E, so again, not a totally exact translation. And they're both very amusing to read. And uh, I, I caught the bug. I started doing these sonnets. When I got to about number 30, I thought, you're being a nerd. <laughs> but, but then I realized that, and I really believe that my versions are much easier, as well as being a lot of fun, 
are much easier to understand than his, because of course uh, he is using a uh, very antique language and he's an extremely convoluted thinker. And why not? Because he's Shakespeare. All right, uh, uh, so that's why I've titled, I took a bit of tasty stuff, but just as to polish up his lust for food, a man may goad his buds with spicy stuff, or to thwart malady and stay in good condition, go down sick by purging tough. So I, full up with your uncloying sugar, took to consumption of acidulous flavours, and sick of fussing, found a vigour in ailing, though it far from crucial was. That's crafty loving, that's anticipating imaginary ills. So things got squalid, I undid my good condition, rank with sating sugars, and I was put to rights by malady. But do I draw a moral? Oh, I do. Drugs poison him that got so sick of you. And uh, we'd like to do one you do know. Uh... My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reads. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. Wonderful, thank you. A gallant comparison. My lady's orbs can't match two suns at noon. Coral, too ruddy, trumps my lady's lip. Snow shows my lady's bosom slushy brown. Black wiry hairs top out my ladyship. Carnations, snow or crimson, don't abound around my lady's physiognomy. As for aromas, it was always found my lady's just unsatisfactory. Though to my lady's larynx I'm in thrall, it falls a long way short of musical. Gods of Olympus probably walk tall, my lady's gates not astromagical. Don't worry though, my girl can still surpass any two crassly sold and broadcast lass. Uh, the, um, what I find, uh, if you don't, uh, the thing about rhyming in English, uh, it's not easy compared to uh, Spanish or, thank you, thank you, Janice, very much. Yes. Very much. Yeah, I was saying about the, um, the rhyming, uh, if in Spanish, you know, it's easy to do rhymes. You've got nada, Spanish armada, big enchilada. Or in Italian, it's similar, so that uh, Dante, you know, was able to write all those works with uh, terza rima, uh, where you need a, a, a triple, uh, three lines rhyming together, which is not at all easy in English. And the reason for that is that we have too many vowel sounds for that purpose. And if you, uh, it's what I call smeared vowels, and uh, smeared and vowel would be examples themselves. And if you take out the letter E, you greatly reduce the number of uh, vowel sounds. Words start to bang and clang. You actually uh, raise the chances of finding a rhyme. So uh, I invite anyone to ask questions or make comments, please. What was the most difficult poem for you to translate? Oh, uh, That's a very difficult question because uh, if I dare compare it to having a baby as a mere man, one forgets the agony and um, moves on. You said in 1959 
that any translation is better than no translation. Yes. But would you like to qualify that remark in the light of computer translation? Uh -huh. <laughs> good point. Very good point. You're absolutely right. Those translations are worse than useless, and we are not about to be replaced by machines in the near future. No, I, it, is a, it, is a, it is a desperate thing to say that a bad one is better than none at all. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Yes? Anyone about the Bible? The Bible? Yes. Yes, well, of course. Absolutely. It was originally written in uh, other languages than English, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. But it's, it's a beautiful English and then into a modern translation. Yes, I know. The modern translation... Uh, Private Eye did a parody in which they took uh, John of Gaunt's great patriotic speech, uh, this precious stone set in a silver sea, and they um, pictured a committee of scholars saying, uh, that's not right because stones don't float. <laughs> so they rewrote it as this precious piece of wood painted to look like, painted to look like stone, and floating in a silver-coloured sea. <laughs> I, I'll start this half with a, a real medical situation, and the poet is Brecht, who you will know as a playwright, but he also happens to have been the greatest German poet of the 20th century. And uh, what I will say about Brecht is I don't think that he is the exclusive property of the hard left. He is not. He is all human life is there. He is an extremely sympathetic and wide-ranging poet. Uh, so this poem is called The 21st Sonnet, and um, the clinic telephones him with news of Margareta, Margareta Steffin, one of his uh, uh, most uh, poetically uh, skilled uh, uh, collaborators and loves. And he mentions some guardians in the poem. Those are six little carved white elephants. I hesitantly moved my hand to raise the black receiver. I was in a fright. Couldn't enjoy it. She's better. Come the night, I thought I'd send a dream with words of praise. This is the dream, that when you're freed to go, our guardians should bow down to you. They ought to trumpet their respect for one who fought so gallantly against the deadly foe. Praise be to them who, when the very ground is swaying, bear their burden, for the greatest triumph is that which no one can demand. And thanks are owed you by the smallest, whitest creature, because you, bravest and astutest, return to us a fighter and a friend. A sonnet by Brecht. Uh, so now I come on to uh, the great Victor Hugo. Is one of his books I hope is visible. It's my book, How to Be a Grandfather. It's his last book of poems. The thing is, he is like the W. G. Grace of French literature. Uh, he was both uh, dominant enormously as a, both statistically and as a personality. And all the poets like Baudelaire, Verlaine, Mallarmé, who are much better known to the uh, English-speaking reader, were in his shadow. Uh, he um, had a disagreement with Napoleon III and went into exile for many years. And I have been in Guernsey, in his wonderful drawing room there, speaking to the Guernsey Literary Festival and being him, and that was an experience. But they thought, how will we get anyone to listen to this funny old geezer? And they brought in a young man uh, to sing to them. And that young man now is on the stage in London. I told his mother he would go far. He was a student then. And he is, if you go to Les Miserables, he is the uh, magnificent fellow on the top of the barricades waving the red tablecloth which has been turned into a flag. That young man is him. He was in the room. He was going, uh, <coughs> Bring him home, bring him home. He's only a boy, like that, uh, while I was reading the poems. Uh, here's one from my book, How to Be a Grandfather. Hugo had, uh, he, he tragically lost members of his family uh, one way or another. He was left, really, with only two little grandchildren, 
who he doted on and rather spoiled, but he took the view, as he did in politics, less discipline, more compassion, more love, less firing on the mob, less punishment, and so on. So this poem is called Penniless Children. Watch this little one with care, filled with God and great in worth. Babes, before they come to birth, shine above in azure air. God in bounty gives us this. They have sent to us on earth all his wisdom in their mirth, all his mercy in their kiss. We are warmed in their sweet light. They are cold and heaven shivers. They are hungry, Eden suffers. Happiness is theirs by right. Men have angels in their power. Every innocent unfed puts on trial the evil doer. Thunder's rage shall wake the dead. God who sent these pretty things to our den of sleep and shadows, sent them down to us with wings, finds them wearing rags and tatters. And now I come on to Jean Cassou. I have two books of him. One is the grey one, which I don't know if it's visible, called 33 Sonnets, thank you. Uh, Cassou uh, is, again, he's a resistant, but he survived. He went on to create the great collection of the French uh, National Museum of Modern Art because he was a distinguished art historian. And uh, he was arrested as a suspect resistant. When I was born, he was in a very cold dungeon, December 1941, making up in his head, having no pen and paper, 33 sonnets, which I turned into English sonnets, and they're alongside his ones. There are other poems, too, in that grey book. So here's one. Since cherry time, I've nursed deep down a wound that opens every day, while by the walls of any town, lilacs and suns and breezes play. Land of blue roofs and grey refrains that bleeds in love's romantic dress, Tell me why each old yard enchains my life with tears and rustiness. I teach the pixies on my way all about Smike and Little Nell. In time the playground tree will tell a rousing tale. One day, one day. Stream forth, bright dawn of carnival, when fists have guns to spark the fray. He didn't, of course, say Spike and Little Nell, but you can guess who it is, it's Fontaine and Cosette. <coughs> and here's one, I have one, which he translated from Hugo von Hofmannsthal, whose birthday it happens to be today. And uh, as, as Hofmannsthal had one Jewish parent, he should not have been uh, published in the Paris Ad Zeitung, which Kasu got hold of in his prison. Uh, so my trans he translated it which sends the introduction by Aragon, a great poet, into ecstasies. Um, so I translated it from the French and German at once, a poem called Die Biden, He and She, Elle et Lui. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll read that one. I'll miss out a different one. At her lips she held a cup, held it safely in her hand. Sure and easy was her tread, not a single drop was shed. Sure and steady was his hand and his horse high-spirited, he with mastery pulled up, made the startled creature stand. Did the strong hand grasp the cup that the fair one offered up? It was not done easily. How they trembled, he and she. Hand by hand was never found, and the dark wine stained the ground. Another book by Kasu is this one, The Madness of Amadis. Uh, but looking at that book... Jean Cassou, The Madness of Amadis, and other poems translated by Timothy Addis. Well, there are three names. Nobody in this country has any idea who any of them are. So, of course, uh, it doesn't work in a bookshop. I persuaded a book uh, seller in a very good shop to put it in the window. He was reluctant, but when he did, it was between Harry Potter and that very high-voiced man who commented on motor races. So, of course, it didn't sell... <laughs> at all, especially as I'd already given a free copy to everyone in that town that I knew. <laughs> uh, so uh, Amadis, Prince of Gaul, uh, a legendary figure, uh, it's a Spanish romance and it is the kind of thing Don Quixote used to read with a 
Tippy with the well-known unsuitable results. And uh, it's rambling, uh, you know, there are knights on quests and ladies and so forth. And uh, when the conquistadors <coughs> in Mexico came between the volcanoes and they saw Tenochtitlan, which became Mexico City, which was bigger than any city in Europe at the time, more splendid, they said, this is something out of Amadis. And the word California also comes from Amadis. But in the case of Kasu, uh, he, uh, he suffered uh, two grievous setbacks. He was uh, left at the liberation of Toulouse in a rather freak situation and was in a coma for many months. And then uh, he uh, di disagreed with his communist colleagues. Uh, you know, over 30% of French voted communist in those days. He disagreed about uh, Yugoslavia uh, quitting from the Comic-Con uh, under Tito. He supported Tito, so they all uh, vilified him for that. So he went through a difficult time. Uh, so Amadis, in his version, withdraws uh, to the... He has a quiet time. He sets aside his princely responsibilities, and goes into desolate places, talks to the shepherds, and eventually goes back to his lady and his palace. I'll just read the first verse and see if you can spot the two deliberate mistakes. And this is... There are five lines in the verse, so I have to produce one triple rhyme and one double rhyme. He, uh, Amadis au tréfonds des forêts fait retraite. À sa jument qui pleure, il a donné congé, baisant un dernier coup l'étoile de sa tête. Puis le col courbé sous sa crinière flammée, elle s'est départie blanche vers d'autres quêtes. He withdraws to the wildwood, the knight Amadis. He sets free for a season his weeping white mare. On the star of her forehead he plants a last kiss. Then she arches her neck with its flame crest of hair, and she canters away on adventures not his. Anyone uh, know enough about horses to spot the two deliberate mistakes, which show us that it is a, it's a fantasy situation, if you like? No, well, uh, 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 horses do not weep, and uh, white horses do not have a, a star on their forehead. Okay, but now I'd like to ask Isabel to come back and help me to read some Spanish. This is my book from the Great Plains of Venezuela. I'll tell you what's happening in here. This is a rapid rhyming duel between the local champion and the singing poets. He's against the devil, so you can see who's going to win that. And... Um, you can hear it on YouTube. If you look in Spanish, Florentino y el Diablo, you get wonderful folk singers with their very high voices. The devil is the shrill, aggressive one. There are musicians in the background going, and they're singing, that's what the devil says here. Answer me this question. And Florentino is more relaxed, just keeps batting him away, going hit all night. There are wonderful birds and trees and the whole life. These are ranch hands. They're working there in, the, in the fields. They do cattle, so they know all there is to know about cattle and horses. Uh, Isabel and I would like to read you a passage, and she will read in Spanish. Uh, it starts with the uh, four lines of the devil, and in this passage... The devil, you, in the game, you're allowed to suddenly switch the rhyme and you keep on insulting and needling at the other player and boasting and try to make them shut up and you can suddenly switch the rhyme. So it's playing for high stakes and the devil suddenly introduces a rather difficult rhyme, ajo, which uh, gets us into some rather abstruse places. So let's take it on now. Siguiendo el trazo del humo que como a Yoga lo trajo, le salgo por otro rumbo a ver si topa el atajo. I swerve with the smoke like tinsel of tinning. I take a new track. Can you go where I'm turning? Now, sirs, you will see. A ver si topa el atajo. Si registró el clarinete, no me toque el contrabajo. Si no me suenan sus platillos como careta y cascajo. 
que todo renglón no es verso, ni rima con conchas de ajo, ni el secreto de repique es cuidarse del palajo. El arte es hasta en el cielo y se inclina su relajo. Si una canje desafina y el director se distrajo. This is Florentino. He says, can you go where I'm turning? If you chose clarinet, sir, don't give me bassooning. Don't clank your brass platters like an ox cart's rough running. Some rhymes are not coming when garlic needs skinning. Bell clappers aren't happy when ringers hang clowning. Art, even in heaven, is all disciplining. Archangels sing flat when conductors gone swanning. And the devil. Ya el director se distrajo, pensando en los humoristas de Escofino y Estrapajo, que aquí en la cara abajo lo apodan Escarabajo, al Visconde de Condevisco y a Mara Ajo Salmarajo. De esos necios pergaminos yo arrugué más de un legajo, aunque me vista de nuevo respeto al ajeno andrajo, cuando cantó con un hombre con el grito lo encorajo, con la audacia lo sacudo, con el número lo aventajo, lo venzo y no lo abochorno, lo castigo y no lo ultrajo. Conductor's gone swanning, file a hoof, love a loofer, he's musing on punning, for the downbeat, despondent dun beetles his kenning, The Viscounts and I squid, trap scallions the cunning. I've crumpled thick parchments of legal unmeaning. I'm spruce, yet respect others patching and darning. When I sing with a man, my top note sets him churning. By boldness I shake him, by wizardry winning. I crush, but don't shame him. I trance without spurning. Lo castigo y no lo trajo. Y hoy refriegos no torturo, pero tampoco agasajo. Si no le echo plomo al tigre, me como el tigre en atajo. Y cuando no hay un becero, me atropella el zarandajo. Si usted es quien me atosiga con mil golpes al destajo, ¿qué culpa voy yo a tener si en el de treco y lo rajo? Contraje mi obligación, la misma que usted contrajo. Fajarme de frente a frente, frente a frente me lo fajo. Samuros de la barrosa, de aconorca, de abajo. Les presento al pesador que nunca saló el tasajo. Ahora verán, señores, al diablo más al trabajo. I trance without spurning. I shun Chinese burning, not whining nor fawning. If I don't shoot the tiger, he'll eat me. No warning, no calf in the offing. I'm bush meat for dining. Sir, if you molest me with summary dunning, what good to protest if my backlash is stunning? I signed on the line, the same as your signing, to tussle head on. Head on, I'm sustaining. Black vultures of Claymar of Corkwood's deep downing. Meet the cheat, the purveyor of brief that wants brining. Now, sirs, you shall see the evil one straining. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I hope you got a feel for that. It's wonderful to have uh, people who can read these languages. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. That's right, because I've come to the very last poem. And it's called Silence. It's by the Mexican Alfonso Reyes. This voice is most slender, my choice to curse thunder, as honey most tender as physic for venom. In a bud that is primed on ephemeral dream, I inquire into ploys to get even with time. I counter the noise with silence, my choice. No less light is the spark that is dark for a moment, and love is still love by intensity silent. Each time fewer words, and each word a verse, each poem a pulse, each pulse universe, a sphere now reduced to the span of its kernel, the moments immortal, the fleetings eternal. So sleep now, my song. You're a dart that fate nailed, whose flight plan has failed. You've lasted too long. Thank you. It's been a very great pleasure. Thank you, Queen's English Society, and to uh, my uh, colleagues and to everybody. Que por esa tierra, no fui 
primera vez que viajo en Yachita, ¿verdad, señores? Que cuando la punta encajó, al mismo limón chiquito me lo chupo de apagado. Me lo chupo de agua.